Oi. Barack, thank you so much for being here with us today. So the Marshall Islands is la launching the first sovereign cryptocurrency with your help. Can you tell us a little bit about this project? Yes. Um, so basically the idea here was to solve a big problem with crypto. That we all really like Bitcoin, but Bitcoin and the other crypto assets, they have a problem, problem which they are like an island. And the island has its own activity and speculation going on and all that stuff. But it's not really connected to the global financial, economic, and banking system. If the idea is to facilitate real uh, commerce and financial use cases with crypto, mm -hmm. you've got to find a way to integrate with the mainland of financial services. You cannot just remain an island. And so we kind of start with the premise of why is crypto an island? Why is it, in a way, ostracized from the mainstream system? And then how can we solve it? The conclusion we got to is that, A, crypto today, there's a lot of regulatory and legal ambiguity as to what is actually its legal status, right? And if you ask the SEC, they would tell you it's a security. If you ask the CFTC, they would tell you it's a commodity. And the IRS would tell you actually that uh, crypto or Bitcoin is is property. And so if you do a simple transaction, like buy a cup of coffee, let's say, with your Bitcoins, yeah. you need to pay capital gains on this transaction, which is a, forget about the taxes, it's a bookkeeping nightmare, right? How do we solve that? We want to have regulatory clarity and, and to really know what is the legal status of this thing. So we basically said, they're going to put it in one of the baskets, right? A security, a commodity, or something. What is, the, what is the natural basket for a currency to legally be a currency? Now, it turns out that then we ask ourselves, OK, what is the legal definition of a currency? So real money is defined by the FATF, the IMF, the IRS, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, as something which is legal, a circulating legal tender of a sovereign nation. Mm -hmm. Basically, there's a monopoly. Only Sovereign entities can issue currency. So that was kind of like the premise of how we started. Let's partner with a country. Let's be hired by a country that is interested in issuing a, a crypto legal tender. So that already differentiates you from all the other cryptos because they're not breaking that definition that's established, that you're partnering with a sovereign. So that's kind of one barrier that you've moved past. Yes. And that is why the currency is called the sovereign or SOV. And why, why the Marshall Islands, though? Why is that the first? Yes. Why does it make sense there? We're looking, um, you know, there's 196 sovereign nations in the world. It's very scarce. You know, we have billions of people. <laughs> you have millions of corporations and only 193 sovereign entities. Now, sorry, 196. And how you, the, the, the biggest, let's say, um, threshold to be sovereign is if you're a voting member of the UN. So we're looking for a country that was a voting member of the UN, mm -hmm. that doesn't have its own currency, and that is small because you got to be able to put all the right people in the same room, you know, uh, in you one week. You just didn't want to deal with the bureaucracy of a very, very big country. Exactly. The, the goal was to make it happen in 2018, to pass the legislation. And lastly, it has to be a, a democracy because we want to deal with a regime that we can identify with their values, right? Mm -hmm and has good relationship with the United States because it's, it's critical. After applying all those filters, uh, the, Mar the Marshall Islands kind of like was shining through. Um, it's, it's, it's a thriving democracy. Uh, they have even a, a woman president. Uh, they have very good relationship with the United States. Um, they have uh, even a compact of free association with, with America. The United States have a missile base over there, etc. cetera. They, ne they never had their own currency. They used the US dollar. Um, and they're a member of the UN. Right. And do you also see the Marshall Islands as a place where the current system disadvantages them particularly more than in the US, for example? That, crypt that the digital currency could help the current structure of the Marshall yes. Islands more so than maybe within the United States, for example? Yes, absolutely. So one of the biggest benefits of uh, cryptocurrencies is that they can really uh, help people in developing nations that are un unbanked. 
because the economics for banks to operate there sometimes are not there. Banks don't want to deal with people who have you know, uh, low income, for instance. And so uh, when you have a crypto wallet, it's, it's like level the playing field, right? Everybody can just download a crypto wallet and have and hold their money in that way. So talk to me about a crypto wallet. How would I hold a crypto wallet? The natural way to, to have a crypto wallet today is on your phone. And you know, the barriers of having a smartphone today are almost like, you can get a, a, an and a Chinese Android for like less than 50 bucks today. So, so you worked with the Marshall Islands. Where are, where are you today with that process? Yeah, so after having moved to the Marshall Islands last year, um, and spending months and months over there, and ended up uh, the, the government there passed a, legisl a legal tender legislation in their parliament. It's called the Sovereign um, Legal Tender Act. And now there's the legal foundation to issue this, the world's first uh, crypto legal tender. What we are uh, doing now is developing the, the technology, the, the, the new type of blockchain mm -hmm. that will basically facilitate this legal tender. It's going to be very different than the blockchains we know today. Because when you're talking about government money that you want to have integrate with the global financial system, you got to have compliance built in. You mm -hmm. got to have real identity. It cannot be anonymous. Anybody that thinks that in a post 9-11 world, you can have a currency go mainstream that is anonymous and doesn't have uh, compliance measures um, is probably putting their, hand, their head in the sand. Right, it's sort of ironic because this whole crypto thing started as fraud and the anonymity and it was associated with crime, but really it can actually help with that because you have footprints and you can actually get rid of the anonymity. There's no reason for that to be a part of it. Exactly so. We kind of like, we kind of ask ourselves, you know, if you have nothing to hide, right? And most people who use crypto or invest in crypto, they don't really have anything to hide. Then in that case, anonymity uh, becomes a, a burden. Uh, and so if, you, if we enable you to hold crypto that can easily be also deposited into a bank, uh, then we have solved a big, a big uh, barrier for mainstream adoption. Mm -hmm. And so if you take this decentralized database, which is essentially a, a, a blockchain that mm -hmm. records all the transactions and you overlay uh, real identities of, on top of it that have been vetted, you know, with all the, yeah, the, to see that you're not some sort of a terrorist or something like that, there's some sort of like a approval process to be able to, to go into the system and start transacting, then you're actually creating, and you add obviously a privacy layer, this is essential, right? Then you have actually created a, a system that is uh, much more compliant than the, uh, not only the, the current cryptos that we have, but also the, the current banking system. So tell me a little bit more about the privacy, how that's kind of different from our current system. Yeah, so first, um, Bitcoin, for instance, it's pseudo-anonymous, meaning that you have your uh, public address and you're kind of like anonymous. But then once you do KYC, your public address is associated to a real identity. And then from that point on, you're actually completely exposed. And everybody knows all your transactions going backwards and also in the future. And so it's, it's essential if you're going to uh, combine identity with a blockchain system to also have privacy measures. Right. Now your privacy in the soft system uh, of the Marshall Islands is going to be maintained. If there is some sort of like a, a global, let's say, a, a court order against you, then the regulars in the Marshall Islands might consider to uh, lift the veil of anonymity from a specific account and give this uh, information to the law enforcement in that country that had this uh, court order. Did you approach the Marshall Islands with this idea? What was their reaction when you said, I want you to launch the world's first cryptocurrency? Yes. So first, when it started, everybody looked, you know, including family and friends, kind of like <laughs> thought that we went crazy. Yes, we're going to get a country to issue a currency. Yes, good luck with that, Barack. But I really thought, and the people working with us, you know, um, that it makes sense. It makes sense for crypto to have a crypto that is a legal tender. It makes sense for the global financial monetary system. Mm -hmm. And it would also make sense for the country because there's a lot of upside for them because they're going to own uh, most of this currency, and if it actually becomes a success, they're going to become, it's, kind of, it's like they found digital gold on their islands. Mm -hmm. And so I believe that if something makes sense, 
then it's bound to happen at one point of time. So why not give it a try, right? When we got to the Marshall Islands initially, uh, we pitched it to um, some of the ministers, the Minister of Finance, and also the Minister uh, uh, and Assistant to the President, Mr. David Paul, and he got it immediately. Wow. Yeah, he was like, wow, that's amazing actually. <laughs> It could really benefit our country because we can become a global financial center, much like you know other island nations that became um, financial centers. Right. But if you're going to do, if you're going to become a financial center in the 21st century, you know everybody understands that the puck is going into blockchain crypto. Why not be the pioneer of that and be the trailblazers and capture all this value there? So he became the main engine for pushing this through and getting the legislation? Yeah, he was a big uh, champion for that. But then it became like more and more people got into that in the Marshall Islands and became excited about it. And they understood how it could really benefit their country long term. And so, so how long was this process? Uh, it was months that we were living there full time and not really communicating too much with the outer world, you know, <laughs> uh, keeping it on the down low until it actually happened. Mm -hmm. And uh, the law eventually passed in the uh, end of February 2018. Okay. And uh, at that point also, um, my co-founder, Dr. Peter Ditus, joined us on the island. Um, Dr. Ditus was the former Secretary General of the B BIS, the Bank of International Settlements. Mm -hmm. uh, arguably the, the most senior you know, monetary economist that has ever joined the blockchain project. But he recognized that there's a lot of things to be fixed in the global uh, monetary and financial system. That's why he was excited about joining this project. So geographically, the Marshall Islands is interesting for this project, mm -hmm. right? Because one of the things you talk about is how there's, what, a thousand little islands that make it up and there were four banks. Yes. So, so this actually is solving a very specific domestic issue for them as yes. well. So the Marshall Islands have 1,153 islands. And uh, only four of them, like uh, major ones, have bank uh, branches. The other ones are uh, mostly cash economies, and they settle between the islands literally with cash on boat. There's a boat going with cash US dollar into the ocean and settling accounts between the islands. Now, once you have a, a national cryptocurrency, all these intra island settlements, this internal remittances and also external remittances uh, becomes uh, just a matter of pushing a button. So the legislation in the Marshall Islands was February of last year. What have you been doing this last year? What has been the work to kind of move this project forward? Uh, we've been actually working on several uh, avenues. Uh, one of them is actually to understand the product requirements for this new type of blockchain that has real identities and compliance baked in. How do you do it in a way that is aligned with uh, the IMF, the US Treasury, the World Bank, et cetera, and the country, obviously, that because they want to be aligned with those institutions. Is it the US Treasury because they're currently on the US dollar? Or do you think the US Treasury is always involved in this sort of decision? Yeah, the, you know, we still live in a world that uh, the United States is the kind of like the, the leading power, the, he the hegemon in, in a sense. So you, you need to be aligned with uh, U.S. interests. So how did the IMF respond to you? Not favorably, initially. Um, and you've got to kind of like go back and think about what is the mandate of the IMF. Okay. The, I the IMF, you've got the World Bank that is kind of like, it's about international development. But then you've got the IMF that is about maintaining global Stability, whatever that means, right? <laughs> because in that sense, everything that kind of like is new goes against the global stability. And if you're talking now all of a sudden about a national legal, crypto legal tender, that definitely kind of like seems uh, maybe not in alignment with global stability from their point of view. And we definitely understand that. And so when engaging with, the, with those institutions, including the IMF, and the benefit of being contracted by, by a sovereign nation is that we get to have those conversations with those geopolitical organizations. And so to understand really what kind of like bothers them and try to alleviate that because we, are, we want to collaborate. 
The idea here is to create something that people will be happy with. We understand that they, their concerns kind of like could be divided in two main buckets. The first bucket is macro stability. Nothing could be more stable than the dollar for them. So why change the dollar, right? But the other kind of like uh, place where they had concerns is uh, uh, compliance, what is called AML and CFT, anti-money laundering and counter-financing of terrorism. This is especially important after 9-11. That's like, you gotta be CFT kind of like resilient. And we said, this is a battle where we can actually win, AML and CFT. That's where we can kind of like shine through. Is that something that the IMF cares about? Is that something within their mandate that kind of resonates with them? Yes, absolutely. Yes. It, it's also something that really resonates with the, with the U.S. Treasury. Mm -hmm. um, were, they, were they hesitant at first as well? Because of those, a lot of people in crypto, including myself, before starting this project, we think that like the, the, the global powers to be, they're against crypto because they're afraid that crypto is gonna replace the current system and all that. I didn't get the impression that this is really what concerns them. They're pretty confident in their own currencies. What really concerns them is that all of a sudden there's a, a, a system that bypasses all the, the sanctions that they might have on countries such as Iran or uh, terror organizations or drug uh, cartels and stuff like this. And, uh, and, and they're concerned that crypto actually, you know, there, there's no measures. Uh, and so it bypasses all the kind of like uh, safeguards and choke points and all that stuff. Would SAV bypass them as well? Or is there enough controls there where they can enforce their sanctions? So that's exactly the system that our engineers are building. Basically, in order to use the SOV blockchain, you've got to obtain something which is called the SOV ID. Think about it as like a digital passport that is being issued to you by the Marshall Islands. It's like, and your SOV account will not operate if you don't have the SOV ID. It's kind of like a car and the ignition key, right? You've got to have the ignition key. And the way to get the SOV ID you need to go through a KYC process, know your customer, where your identity is being basically checked, verified, and then vetted with those lists. Uh, one of those important lists is called the OFAC list. This is the list where the United States Treasury puts all the bad guys, all the terrorists, all the drug lords, all that on this list. So we kind of like check your identity that you're not on this list, God forbid, right? Mm -hmm. And only if you kind of like came with a check mark, you issue the SOV ID. And then you can only transact on our system when you have the SOV ID. And all the SOV IDs are being repeatedly monitored and checked versus this OFAC list if there was any change, right? You need to go through a, like a higher bar mm -hmm. of, of kind of like due diligence and all that. But once you've met this bar, everything inside is much easier for you. So is there any concern that the government could use this? It's too much power. They can just turn off the ignition on your, on your SOV ID? You got to remember in this context that a, a great deal of the wealth of the Marshall Islands, or most of the wealth, hopefully, will be derived from the SOV, its value, and the ecosystem that will build around it. When so, you talk about its value, you're talking about the appreciation of the currency? Yes, absolutely. So a lot of their uh, national wealth will come from, from the value of this currency. And so they have all the reasons in the world to make sure that this is a thriving currency, right. it's not being uh, abused, you know, and, and only if there's a, a, a court order against you, then the, the veil of anonymity will be removed and, will be, and your transaction will be checked. Otherwise, they don't really have any business to look into your right. transactions. It's the same incentive that a co country has to pay their debt and not just default because eventually they'll need to go back to the market and raise the money, and it's more expensive if you don't have the precedent to make it work well. Exactly. So the, they the, want it to function. They're, yeah. not, they, they're not incentivized to manipulate or take advantage of this power. Exactly. The, the economic incentives are the best thing to keep, to keep you in check, basically. So then tell me about trade when it's, a, when it's someone who's outside of the Marshall Islands. Because if you come to me and you're like, hey, let me pay you and solve this crypto, I might laugh. Mm -hmm. So how, how, do you, how do you do that? I mean, I don't have a way to take crypto as payment. Yes. So it's important to emphasize that the, we believe that the rollout of the solve into the global financial system is going to be a gradual process. We don't 
We don't really think it's going to be an overnight that, you know, everybody in the world will accept Sov. So that being, that being said, though, that being said, Sov has the benefits of, like, think about, like, a bridge between this crypto island and the mainland. It has one leg here and one leg here. So on the one hand, you'll be able to hold and transact Sov, like any other cryptocurrency, hold it in a crypto wallet, send it over the crypto rails, trade it on cryptocurrency exchanges. It will have all that. On the other hand, it's a fiat currency that legally, at least, and also now it has compliance, can be held in a bank. So we'll be able, if, you, if you're not savvy with crypto and all that stuff, you can just hold your SOV in a, in a bank account in the Marshall Islands or hopefully afterwards also in other places. And then you can have a credit card connected to your SOV account and then just pay with your SOV in any business that accepts a Visa or MasterCard just in the same way, if you come today with your U.S. card and you go to, let's say, Europe, you can just pay with your credit card over there. So in that sense, um, Sov will be the first crypto that has all the wonderful benefits of, uh, of crypto, but could also become a global trading currency because it has all the network effect that fiat currency has. So do you see a, a phase-in process when in the Marshall Islands you could use both Sov and dollar? Yeah, absolutely. So I can invest in the SOV next year, and then how do the, these financials work? So basically, 80% of the initial SOV units will be issued to the Marshall Islands government, sovereign wealth funds, and the citizens themselves. Um, and part of it also goes to the SOV development fund, which is an independent fund from the government, but the government has two uh, directors in this fund. So that's 80%. Of the... Tokens. Yeah, there will be 20 of the currency. There will be the initially currency. 24 million SOV units. And How then many? 24 million. And then there will be also 10% that goes to uh, initial investors that uh, will fund the project. And then another 10% goes to, towards uh, funding the development and the maintenance of the SOV from now until the end of times, basically. Which is your, yeah. your firm. Not only our firm, but... From that, we're also going to get paid. So basically, we have tied our faith uh, with the SOV, meaning that the Marshall Islands are not paying us in, in US dollar. There's no uh, uh, burden on their budget at all. We're basically only getting paid from this future currency that we are helping them develop. Now, if this, if this currency uh, become a big success, then obviously we have, we're uh, financially incentivized to make this happen, uh, right? And, but if not, we have invested you know, millions of dollars from our pocket right. um, to help So 24 out. million seems very low to me as a total number. Well, how did you come to that number? That, that's a good question. So probably people will kind of like more talk about in the, in the sense, sense of the SOV, which are called SOVIs. So there'll be SOVIs, I like that. yeah. <laughs> and there'll be 2.4 billion SOVIs, right? So people will buy and transact in those SOVIs. Mm -hmm. Uh, the number 24 was chosen because of they have in the Marshall Islands 24 kind of like atoll districts, which are like group of islands. And so it's a symbolic number to their uh, um, heritage. And how do you decide how to distribute them to the citizens? Or is that completely the Marshall Islands? So 10% of the total uh, supply goes to the citizens directly as in kind of like an airdrop, a gift. They don't need to pay for it. But you've got to be a resident of the Marshall Islands um, to encourage the people that are actually living in the islands to, to, to get it, yeah. Do they think that this will incentivize people to move to the Marshall Islands? They have now a, a diaspora, a Marshallese diaspora in the United States. Maybe some of them will come back, you know, because of this renewed economic activity and the Marshall Islands becoming uh, a financial center where, you know, there, there's going to be a second wave of kind of like, there was the legal tender law, and the second wave would be laws and regulation uh, uh, kind of like leveling the field for people to come there and set up um, all kind of uh, blockchain and crypto uh, financial services uh, businesses such as exchanges and banks and all that uh, will be served by the, the SOV currency. So all the taxes will be paid with SOV, all the dues, all the fees when you trade in, uh, in those exchanges. So would that be on a computer? You can access your SOV in different wallets? Yeah, you'll be able to, to access your SOV as a Marshallese uh, or everybody in the world as a, in a wallet, on, uh, either on your mobile phone, on your computer. Uh, might even be a, a, 
a, a, a cache version of the soft that has a little chip that kind of like uh, represents one soft on the blockchain. And we have uh, actually a, quite a nice collaboration with a company helping uh, build this uh, cache version of the soft. And to pay, what, what is the verification? Is it fingerprints or if you just have the wallet, you can pay with it? Yeah, so there will be different type of wallets, right? Our, our company will build uh, one wallet, but definitely we, we are developing APIs to the blockchain for other parties to develop their own solution and own wallets. And we invite you know, people to choose the wallet that they feel is the, uh, has the best usability and the best uh, safety. And some of those wallets will also have, obviously, um, two-factor authentication, meaning that you would have a, a password, but also maybe a, a fingerprint or some sort of other uh, uh, biometric marker mm -hmm. to provide this uh, additional uh, security and safety. So from today forward, what, what is the process? What are the next couple of years going to look like? This year was all about kind of product requirements, uh, engaging with the global uh, reg uh, geopolitical organizations, and uh, starting the development of the actual blockchain. Next year is going to be uh, what the Marshall Islands government called a TRMI, Timed Released Monetary Issuance, mm -hmm. a process where the SAV will be gradually sold um, to the global investor community. That's next year. Yeah, in a series of, of uh, auctions over uh, probably 18 months. And once the TRMI has concluded, the SAV mainnet will be ready and the soft will start circulating in the Marshall Islands and globally and be traded in exchanges and uh, crypto exchanges. And, and then after that, you know, we, we want to work heavily on uh, doing all the integration with banks to show them our compliance measures and the legal framework. And, we, and you know, the years following, we see how soft will start trading maybe on trading desk of regular banks. Because today, when you think about it, there's a big, a lot of buzz and hoopla about banks such as um, Goldman Sachs starting to uh, a Bitcoin trading desk. But actually, they kind of like there was a problem there. I think they even shut it down maybe because they didn't know how to account for the, for the Bitcoins on their books. Like, what is it and how to deal with it from tax wise? There's so much like ambiguity. Mm -hmm. But now you've got a crypto that is just a currency, like euro, like shekel, like yen. So the trading desk of banks might start also trading it going forward. Well, in order to use it, let's say, from a, with a credit card, mm -hmm. you'd have to have exchanges with every other currency, right, that you could trade? With the, main, with the main currencies, yes. Why a cryptocurrency, a digital currency? I mean, to me, my credit card or debit card seem, feels the same. Everyone puts a little Foursquare thing into their phone and swipes. It seems to get rid of the problem of cash on board, cash on boat. So why, why a digital currency and not just keep up with this current system that seems to be working okay? Couple of things. You know, 2.5 billion people on this earth don't have a bank account. And by virtue of not having a bank account, they don't even have a credit card, right? Mm -hmm. That's one thing. So financial inclusion is key, and that's a major use case for crypto, and especially, I would hope so, for SAV. The second use case is that cryptos allow you to be the custodian of your own money in a digital manner. So today you have two options. Either you put your money in, the, in your mattress or you put it in a bank. Now banks have counterparty, counterparty risks, right? We've seen it in 2008. In a sense, the global banking system broke, it fell down. They're all on the way to default, to go the way of Bear Stearns and Lehman Brothers. And if the US federal government uh, uh, didn't uh, save AIG, then Goldman Sachs will also fall, and then the rest of the global banking system. And we'd, if you have more than $100,000 in the bank that is FDIC insured, you would have lost your money, right? Mm -hmm. And so crypto, for the first time, allows you to hold your own money, but not in the mattress, but inside a crypto wallet where you hold the key, and you, kind of like, you are the actual owner of your money. This is something that's profoundly transformative, and I believe good to reduce this counterparty risk, especially as some people might argue, we're going to another global kind of like monetary or financial Recession, meltdown, yeah. catastrophe, whatever you want to call it, right? When this happens, crypto will kind of like shine through. Um, so so uh, custodianship of your own money and eliminating counterparty risk is a key benefit of crypto. 
So going back to the hurdles, one of the things we spoke about was this um, idea that most people associate it with fraud and money laundering. Mm -hmm. what, what else, once you get convinced everyone, oh no, this is actually going to help catch the bad guys. What other hurdles do you see up ahead? So I actually see it, if you, if you kind of go back to the early days of the internet and talk about media, right? Remember that, remember that you'd use the internet to pirate movies with BitTorrent and audio and music with Napster. The media companies, like the banks today with crypto, the media companies like, oh my God, the internet is very, very bad. If you use internet, it's to pirate stuff, right? But then came the second wave of uh, streaming media online, came companies that actually saw, you know what, people want to download content online. They don't want to hold a CD, physical CD. They want to kind of stream the stuff. Let's give them a, a, a good way to do it, right? That, that's how Spotify, <laughs> right? Spotify and Netflix built wonderful businesses uh, thanks to this model. And today, everybody, you know, it's like they're the best buddies of the media companies. That's basically most of their revenue. Mm -hmm. So in the same way, we can strive that the solve will become the, the Netflix of digital money. The Netflix of digital money. Exactly. Is that your slogan? Um, it's kind of like uh, <laughs> coming up as one. Yeah, it might be. If another country were to do this, it wouldn't be the SAV, it would be their own currency. But our country is hesitant of doing this because it really cuts into their power of monetary policy, right? I wouldn't, it's hard to speak about countries, but the people who are leading those countries, right, or their monetary systems, they are totally aware that there's a new type, there's a new game in the block, right? It's called blockchain, it's called crypto. And they are aware, I believe, uh, and this is also my impression from interacting with them, that this is where the, the puck is heading. You, you, gotta, you gotta be there. But obviously they're also very apprehensive. They're very conservative uh, in nature. And so they're kind of like looking at Bitcoin and they're concerned because they wanna be in this game, but this game lacks all the stuff that they need. They don't have compliance, built in, it doesn't have compliance in its design even about thinking about it, right? It doesn't have the right legal frame, framework. And so I actually believe that, and Dr. Dittis, our, our chief economist, coming from this system, we believe that central banks would love to have a system like that as long as it has the stuff that they need. That's like a blockchain that, that has a certain customer in mind. And this customer is, is a government or central bank, right? Think about a, a central bank now that has a, a cryptocurrency as their legal tender. They can actually have much better read on the, how the economy is doing. They don't need to do polling like you did like 100 years ago. You, you see in real time the velocity of money. You see transaction. You can even see like aggregate anonymized data on what are people spending on, how is consumer spending going, what are they spending on. It's actually, when you think about it, it's a central banker wet dream come true. Well, but on the other side, one of the main things we rely on is the ability for a central bank to change the rates depending on, to kind of alleviate the economy when need be or tighten the economy when they see different data flowing through. So you're really taking away a very big power in the central banks. And the Marshall Islands, they don't have it anyway because it's the U.S. dollar. They're, they're not controlling it. But these, these countries that are really playing around with their monetary policy to complement their fiscal policy, they, they might be very hesitant to want this. So some people uh, would view what you're describing, like centralized control over the money supply, as a feature, like you know the Keynesian approach. And some people, like Austrian school economists, would see it as a bug, mm -hmm. right? And they would, they would think that the market needs to kind of like set uh, supply and demand of a currency, just like any other uh, commodity. And so the Marshall Islands decided to go with this approach. And mind you, even before that, they were not controlling the money supply. They're using the U.S. dollar. So someone else was actually right. was controlling it. 
Now they have a blockchain system controlling the money supply, right? Other countries that might use our, the technology that our company is building might want to uh, use a different monetary engine. So it's kind of like we're building it where the monetary engine is kind of like a module that is plug and play. And so if the Central Bank of Canada or Sweden would like to use our technology, they could develop, they can basically, we can develop a monetary engine that would suit their, suit their needs and where they can control stuff. So it's quite flexible in that regard. They would control the money supply. Yes. So instead of changing rates, you would control how much currency is out in the system. Yes. So do you think one day the United States Treasury might wake up and say, hey, people trust the SOV and these digital currencies more because there isn't a central bank who can tomorrow change their interest rate and change the value of the currency. People feel like now it's this kind of more commodity-driven digital currency that's driving it, and the U.S. dollar just doesn't have value over a period of years. Uh, I think we still have a, a long time until something like that might happen. You know, people still have a lot of faith in the U.S. dollar. Um, I do think that the future of money is digital, and I believe in uh, free markets and competition, and I think there should be all sorts of flavors and different type of currencies. Um, right now, we only have kind of like this one type of, of fiat currency, which is kind of like centrally managed by a central bank. And I think that people, once they start using a sovereign currency that is also digital, can settle uh, uh, immediately with no fees. You can also be the custodian of your own money. And you know that there's, it's the, the money supply is kind of like set and it's not being manipul manipulated by a central bank. This type of, all those benefits and this certainty and this temper-proof nature of this currency might kind of like set it apart in the competitive landscape of currencies. And so more and more, more people will start using it. And as more and more people will start using it, the solve the sovereign currency of the Marshall Islands, uh, bigger countries and bigger governments might start to wake up and say, we want to be also competitive in this market of national currencies, and we cannot stay with just like a paper version of our money, and they would go this direction as well, just to remain competitive. In the same manner that today, you know, governments, they're using the internet and email and all that. You cannot escape it. You, gotta, you either go with technology or you're left behind. So in your vision of the future, every country will have a digital currency? In my vision of the future, every country will have a digital currency. Those that will not have a digital currency will be outcompeted. And just to kind of have it on record, a guess as to what year that will be, where do, we, where do you place your bets? So, you know, some people might say uh, 20 years, some people might say 15 years. But one thing that I've realized is that technology changes our world much faster than we actually realized. That iPhone today, that is something, or a smartphone, something that today is ubiquitous. You cannot envision your life without it, right? If you lose now your iPhone, you're like lost. What am I doing? My life is over. It's only been a little bit over a decade, you know, 12 years since the first iPhone came out. Think about social media, right? It's been maybe uh, 14, 15 years since Facebook came out, and now everybody's connected. Think about Uber. Uber is maybe, what, less than a decade old, actually. And now it's like a way to go, uh, you know, it's, it's basically the way to connect with transportation. Right. And Netflix and Spotify are other such uh, examples. And so it's been 10 years since the original white paper by Satoshi Nakamoto of the Bitcoin came out in 2009. It seems like we're due. Ten, exactly. <laughs> so those first years, those, this first decade is like kind of like coming out of age, you know? You're still like scruffy, rough around the edge, uh, edges. You have your, you know, it's like you're a teenager. You have your zits, you know, all that. <laughs> but now the new wave, the second wave is coming. Uh, the wave that is kind of like more of like uh, has panache, right? And has the, the, the stuff that you need built in, kind of like the, the Netflix and the Spotify. It has the compliance. It's aligned. It's easy to use. And I'm, I'm excited to be part of this uh, second wave of, of crypto because I, I do believe that it's going to change our world 
profoundly and much faster than most people uh, believe. So under 15 years is where we're, where, where we're putting it? I think the next five years are going to wow. be uh, critical. Because think, look at the Bitcoin. If you just look at the prices, right? It started, the market cap was less than a million. Then in the wave in 2013, we reached a market cap of like two, three billion. People thought, oh my God, this digital stuff is worth billions of dollars. Now the market cap is over a hundred billion dollars. It's $140 billion, I think, today. So it's not, not, nothing that you can actually ignore. The next wave of kind of like appreciation would bring it, the market cap of cryptos over a trillion dollar. Once you're in the trillion dollar kind of like game, that's it. It's mainstream. It's no longer something that people say, oh, it's new. Oh, it's like, you know, it's, you, you, you have to deal with it. Well, it sounds like I should start selling my dollars in the next five years. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's been very informative, new, and a pleasure having you. Thank you, Gabby. It's, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of Real Vision, and it's uh, a big uh, pleasure to be here.